What a morning to be together at church. Really good to be here sharing with you. Today we're continuing in our church-wide series we've been doing called Your Kingdom Come. A little brief recap for those who are maybe joining with us just for today. Um, we've been looking at this, this idea of capturing a kingdom vision for our lives and the values of the kingdom, and particularly some of those values that are really important for us as a church. And so far, in this part two of the series, we did part one earlier in the year, we've looked at being generously compassionate, if you're with us for that one. We looked at the week after being compelled by God's love to reach out. We're not to be inward focused, always looking out. Last weekend, uh, we looked at, with Pastor Andrew, empowering every believer that every one of us have been gifted, called by God, have a part to play. And this week, we're looking at overflowing with gratitude and grace. Um, Several years ago now, I I was trying to impress on my five-year-old daughter a little lesson in thankfulness. And we were getting ready to go for a swim in our backyard pool. And uh, I thought this is a great opportunity to let her know, you know, how to be thankful and things we should be thankful for. And I was telling her, you know, how blessed we are to have a pool in our backyard. Not everyone has a pool. So we're putting our sun cream on. And as I'm giving her this little lesson, I could see her little five-year-old mind ticking over at the time. And a couple of weeks earlier, we'd been to Wet n Wild with the youth. This was quite a long time ago, one of their trips down there, and we happened to go down with them. And I could see her mind ticking over, and she looked at me, and she said, Dad, do you know who is really blessed? And I looked at her and said, I, I, no, I don't know. Tell me who's really blessed. She said, Wet n Wild. They have heaps of pools down there at Wet n Wild. <laughs> Fair enough. They are very blessed, Wet n Wild. Good logic there. Um, But we know, we know that God's heart for us is to be a thankful people. Uh, In fact, not just thankful, but overflowing with gratitude and grace. A couple of verses, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Psalm 100, many of us know well, enter his courts with thanksgiving. Come in with praise into his presence. This is how God wants us, wants us to be part of who we are as his followers. But I don't know about you, but something I've realised over the years is that giving thanks or being thankful is something that does not come naturally to me. Uh, In fact, one of the first things we have to learn as children, isn't it, is to say thank you. We just don't know that automatically. We have to teach that to our kids. My default preset. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, it's um, to grumble and complain. That comes easily to me, very easily. Thankfulness, not so easy. I was reading the story of an Uber driver who was driving a, a passenger and he had to drive this passenger over a new bridge in his city and the bridge design was quite complex and a bit confusing and the Uber driver was having trouble navigating it. And so he turned to his passenger and said, gee, I'd love to meet the genius who designed this bridge. And the passenger said, well, today's your lucky day. My name's Mark. I'm the engineer who designed this bridge. And the Uber driver said, thankfully, he was very gracious, the, uh, the, the um, passenger. But our grumbling and complaining can so often get us into um, some awkward situations. It's never good for us. Um, in fact, it always, um, in some way, pulls away um, from, from what the blessing that God wants for us. There's nothing new about this. Um, this actually, this, this difficulty we have in giving thanks, the Bible talks about another group of people going back three and a half thousand years who made grumbling and complaining into an art form. If you know much about their story, this group of people was, of course, the Israelites who God rescued out of Egypt from slavery. Miracle after miracle parts the Red Sea, um, destroys the, the pursuing army. Incredible miracles to bring them out of slavery into freedom. And yet we read in Exodus 15, just three days later, just three days after these miracles, the Israelites are grumbling and complaining in Marah. And so God steps in again, blesses them. But again, not long after that, they're grumbling and complaining. We actually read in Exodus 16, just one month after God had brought them out of Egypt, done the most incredible miracles you could ever imagine. This is what they said. This is what it says, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. And you read that story and you think, how could they possibly be grumbling after what God has done? Like just miracle after miracle providing for them. But if we are honest with ourselves... We can all very easily be like this, can't we? We can so quickly forget God's blessings and are so quick to grumble and complain. 
And we see in the scripture that this actually breaks God's heart. Uh, We see how seriously God takes a a, a spirit of complaint or grumbling like this. In the New Testament, we read these words in 1 Corinthians 10. It says, And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened as examples and were written down as warnings for us, warnings for you and me this morning, on whom the fulfilment of the ages has come. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a pretty full-on passage, isn't it, when you read it? Um, I don't know, we might think, well, a bit of grumbling, complaining, that's not that big a deal before God. But we see here that God treats this very seriously. It breaks his heart and, and it has very serious consequences, both physically but also spiritually. Why, why is God so concerned about our grumbling? Well, the reason is because he knows how destructive it is in our lives. Um, Romans 1 actually talks about this, that although says although people knew God, they neither gave thanks, they neither recognised him or gave thanks to him. And it says, and their thinking became futile and their hearts became darkened because they stopped giving thanks to God. And there is something true about when we, when we fall into this pattern of ungratefulness, our, our hearts become hardened. It allows a root of bitterness, resentment to take hold very easily in our lives. And not only is it destructive in our own lives, it's destructive in our relationships with those around us. A lack of gratitude, it, it, it damages our relationships. It, it has, an, it has a, a, a killing off effect um, in those relationships. Not only that, it undermines the unity of the body of Christ, doesn't it? The oneness, the unity we know. And on, on top of all of that, it weakens our witness to those around us. Let's be honest, nobody wants to be around a grumbling, a complaining person. And it weakens our, our witness because we're the most blessed people in all the world. We of all people have so much to be thankful for, for all the blessings that God has poured out upon us. And so the question is, how then are we to cultivate a heart of thankfulness? How do we cultivate this? How do we make sure that we don't go down the track of an ungrateful spirit or a grumbling, complaining spirit? Well, the first way, just a couple of practical things this morning. The first way is thing is this, is to cultivate a heart of thankfulness, the first thing to do, believe it or not, is to complain. Now, you, let me clarify that before you go, great, thank you very much. Psalm 142 puts it like this. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him. This is the key. I pour out before him my complaint. Before him I tell my trouble. This is incredibly powerful. These are the Psalms of lament. And there's a whole number of them right across the scriptures and lamentations as well. You know, it's easy to give thanks when everything is going well. But it's another thing to give thanks when you're in the deepest, darkest trials of life. That's another thing altogether, isn't it? That's a different place. And I know that, um, well, all of us know that this life is full of deep challenges and trials. Some of you in the midst of those deep challenges and trials this morning. And maybe today you are asking those questions. Why, God? Why have you put me in this situation? Why have you allowed this to happen to me? We heard some of those questions in, in Rob's testimony. Why, God? Why are you doing this? And maybe you're in that place where you're saying, God, why have you allowed this health situation to come to me at the moment? Why why me? Or why, God, are you allowing this situation relationally to take place for me? Why this work um, issue that's going on at the moment? God, why have you put me in this? Where are you? Why aren't you answering my prayers? Financially, God, where are you in the midst of this challenge, this trial at the moment? And I want to tell you that giving thanks in that situation, those situations, isn't it about just pretending or, or, or just putting up some sort of fake facade. That's not what we're talking about here in Overflowing with Gratitude and Grace. God knows already what you're really thinking and feeling. He knows that. You can't hide that from him anyway. He doesn't want you just to bottle it up, stuff it down deep within you somewhere. No, that's not what he's saying here. God invites you. He says, what I want you to do is I want you to come to me. Pour it out to me. Bring your complaint to me, bring your troubles to me, cry out to me. So often, isn't it, when we're in that place, we, we go around to everyone else, but God says, don't, don't go there, come to me, first and foremost. He is big enough for it. Many people have noted over the years that 
um, when it says in 1 Thessalonians there, give thanks in all circumstances, it doesn't say give thanks for all circumstances. You don't have to give thanks for the circumstance you're in, but to give thanks in all circumstances. And how powerful it is when someone has a thankful spirit when they're in the midst of trials. Have you seen that? That is powerful. And we have many across our church family, in fact, who have had long, long journeys with trials and and difficulties and challenges they've faced. And in the midst of it, as they've had this same approach, coming to God, not hiding things, being honest, but then flowing um, out of that into thanksgiving. What a powerful witness and what a blessing it is to us. Many people I can think of and know of here this morning, in fact, who have done that journey. And, you know, some of these people are the most thankful people you'll ever encounter. And you see in the psalmist that there's something powerful as we come honestly before God. If you read the psalms of the lament, they actually begin to shift. God, where are you? What are you doing? And then by the end of the psalm, it comes right around. But God, thank you that you're faithful. <laughs> thank you that you're good. Thank you that you've never left me. And this is what God invites each one of us to do, to come before him in this way. And to understand too, so many can testify to this, that sometimes when you're in that place, God is working out a plan far greater than what you even realise in that moment too. It's about trusting, giving thanks is trusting and God's got a sovereign plan that he's working out. I remember reading the story of David Livingston, the great missionary to Africa who served over there between the late 1800s, mid 1800s and um, there was a situation where he was trying to go into a new region of Africa and part of the tradition there was if you were moving into a new tribal area, there was a practice that would go take place where the new person entering in would meet with the chief and you would exchange gifts and how it would work is the person entering into that space would lay out all their possessions before the chief and the chief would get to choose one of those possessions and in return he would decide what he would give as a gift and so on this particular occasion David Livingston was heading into this new area he came before the chief and he laid out his possessions before him as was tradition and I mean David Livingston didn't have many possessions anyway he had a few books he had a watch He had a few clothes and then he had a goat that provided him with milk. And this goat was really critical for him because he had a stomach condition that gave him a lot of of trouble um, in all of his work. But he was able to drink the goat's milk and it would help settle his stomach. He couldn't drink the local water. And so he's laying out everything before this chief. He says, God, he can take whatever he wants, but Lord, do not let him touch that goat, please. You know how much I need that goat. And sure enough, the chief chooses the goat and then gives David Livingston this walking stick and he David is is grumbling he grumbled to God you can read about it he was not happy he said God what are you doing why would you take that goat you know how much I need that goat and now I've got this walking stick what are you doing God here I am trying to serve you and it wasn't until a little while later that somebody um, saw him with this stick and said to David one of the local people said do you know what you've got in your hand there is no no a walking stick he said no 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 that is the king's very own scepter the chief scepter it is the sign of his authority wherever you go now when they have that stick people have to open the way for you and give you whatever you need and God literally opened up Africa as we know for David but isn't that incredible in the midst of situations and trials we go God what are you doing here but as we come God I'm trusting you I'm looking to you God is able to work out his plans and purposes and we can thank him even in the midst of that. So it's the first one, cultivating a heart of thankfulness is come to God honestly. This isn't about faking it, pretending. This is about being real with God. The second thing we can do is to actually express thanks, to actually speak it out, sing it out. This is what Psalm 92 says. It's good. It's so good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing his praises, sing praises to the Most High. It's good to proclaim your unfailing love in the morning, your faithfulness in the evening. The psalmist had learnt something. There's something powerful about not just thinking these thoughts, but actually speaking them out, singing them out, writing them down. And we need to take time. If you want to cultivate a heart of thankfulness, take time. It seems so obvious, but how often do we forget to do this? Take time to express your thanks and appreciation to God. The other week I was reading a Daily Nudge that comes out from Carl Fays every couple of weeks and it was talking about gratitude and it spoke about um, a professor, Robert Emmons is his name, professor of psychology at the University of California, who has shown that the practice of gratitude can increase happiness levels by 25%. He claims that this can be achieved simply by writing a gratitude journal. A few hours, he says, spent counting one's blessings over three weeks can create an effect that lasts six months. 
Emmons contends that practising gratitude boosts the immune system, bolsters resilience to stress, lowers depression, increases feelings of energy, determination and strength, and even helps you sleep better at night. Who would have thought, he said, that the simple act of writing down things we are thankful, thankful for and taking time to count our blessings would have such a profound impact? Isn't that incredible? Such a simple act... You can see why God's so big about us having a thankful heart, can't you? Why it's so important. He knit us together. He knows us better than anyone. And not only that, not only to take time to thank, give our thanks to God for his blessings to us, but to take time to express our thanks and appreciation to others. How powerful is that as well? Often we think thoughts of gratitude, but we forget to express them. We forget to speak them out. In fact, I read a quote recently that says this, that gratitude is what we feel, but giving thanks is what we do. Right? That's the actual action. We think these thoughts, we see people and think, gee, I'm thankful for that person, but we don't ever tell them, we don't express it, we don't speak it out. Um, a survey done by Janice Kaplan found that while more than 90%, 90% of people think gratitude makes you happier and gives you a more fulfilled life, less than half regularly express gratitude. So it's in here in the mind, but the key is to speak it out. It's so powerful to do that. We see this pattern um, um, in our relationships with one another. Um, the, pa- the pattern in Scripture we see is Philippians 1. Paul says, I thank my God every time I remember you. Um, 1 Corinthians, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. And again and again we see this through the Scriptures where the importance of thanking one another And the blessing that brings to our relationships around us and the unity of the body of Christ is so, so important. Um, I was reading, in fact, um, talking about the power this has in our relationships with others. I was reading an uh, an article recently entitled, This Might Be the Key to a Happy Marriage, is what it said. It was a recent study from the Journal of Personal Relationships and they interviewed 468 married couples on relationship satisfaction, covering everything from communication communication um, habits to finances, and they found that the most consistent, significant predictor of happy marriages was whether one spouse expressed gratitude. He said this in the study, feeling appreciated and believing that your spouse values you directly influences how you feel about your marriage, how committed you are to it, and your belief that it will last. It went on um, to say that um, this is true for good times, but perhaps especially for bad ones. When couples experience stress and their communication devolves into what researchers call a demand withdraw cycle, gratitude can disrupt this acting as a buffer. This is incredibly powerful. Um, and the author, Alan Barton, says the, the study goes to show that the power of the key to a happy and lasting marriage might be as simple as regularly expressing gratitude. Isn't that powerful? It shows you how powerful this is. Just a simple act of saying thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you um, for the blessings that you give to me. And we know that's not just about marriage relationships. That applies to every relationship we have with others, whether it be in a workplace, whether it be wherever we are. So important that we are expressing thanks to God and to others as we seek to cultivate a heart of thankfulness. But by far the most powerful in terms of cultivating a heart of thankfulness is actually encountering and experiencing God's grace. The word for um, thankfulness in the New Testament is the word Eucharistio. I think they're going to put it up on the screen for you, this word. And uh, Eucharistio, right in the middle of this word is the word charis, which is the Greek word for grace. So literally, at the heart of thankfulness is as an encounter or understanding or experiencing the grace of God. If we want to really, truly develop a heart of thankfulness, we need to encounter God's grace. And when I'm talking about God's grace, I'm talking about two, two parts of that. One is God's common grace. That is the awareness that everything we have is a gift from God. The Bible says this, every perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights. The, the truth that he sustains all things, the very fact that we are here, that we are breathing, that we live in this country, everything we have, all of it is a gift of God's grace for us. And when we understand this, it shifts our hearts from this, this sense of entitlement, will I deserve this, to God, thank you for blessing me and, and giving this to me as a gift. It's a massive shift. God's common grace, but even more powerful than that is understanding his saving grace. 
Just last week, a couple here in the church sent me a photo. They're on holidays at the moment. They're in Corumba in the Gulf of Carpentaria. And they sent me this beautiful picture of a sunset. And when I first saw the sunset picture, there it is up there. I thought, wow, that's a nice picture. It looks great. Um, and then I read the message that came with it. It said, hi, Nathan, while we were at Corumba last Friday, sitting on the beach, eating fish and chips, watching the sunset, we took this photo. When viewing it later, we were reminded that we are separated from God by our sin, but we have salvation through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for us. How amazing is God? Blessings, Andrew and Nola Faye. And then I looked at the picture again. If you zoom in on the picture, I looked a bit closer. Can you see the cross in the sand there and the sun above it? I went, wow, how amazing is that? And I totally understood what Andrew and Nola were talking about. I had the same response. My heart overflowed with thankfulness because we know there's a picture there, isn't it, of the cross where Jesus gave his life for us, his saving grace, took our place, took the penalty that we deserve so that we could be forgiven, so that we could know what it means to experience freedom in him. And then above the sun, for me, it looked like the empty tomb. That's My mind went straight to the empty tomb, the light shining out of it and... The cross and the resurrection, that not only did Jesus die on the cross for us, but he rose again so that we could be born again, no new life, a fresh start, and the assurance of eternal life in him, that we can live forever, that there's coming a day where he's going to put everything right. And my heart overflowed with thankfulness for God's incredible blessing to us. You see, when we understand that God has rescued us, that he has forgiven us, that he has redeemed us, welcomed us into his family we've heard this this morning through the baptisms given us the assurance of eternal life you can't help but have a heart full of thanks overflowing with gratitude and grace every time you come back to that truth no matter what the circumstances of life gratitude is a natural response to salvation it doesn't require coercion or encouragement It just flows organically, abundantly when you understand that truth. If you're here this morning and you've never encountered that for yourself personally, you saw it through the baptisms or you see it in other people here this morning, you go, I want that. This is the truth to grab hold of. What Jesus has done for us on the cross, that he rose again. And we'd love to help you find out more about that. You too can know this same incredible overflowing joy and freedom and thankfulness and peace that comes through what Jesus has done for us. I got an email, in fact, this week that um, really highlighted this truth um, really well as well. As you know, we've been talking a lot about um, throughout this, this season around that multiplying effect, God wanting to use each one of us to reach out to those around us. And recently, a business owner in this church had an amazing opportunity to... Um, to connect with another business owner who had come to faith in completely amazing circumstances through, through some, some things online, came to faith, had an amazing turnaround. And this guy, this business owner here in our church has had a chance to get alongside him and, and encourage him. And recently the wife of this man who came to faith sent this man in our church uh, an email and uh, it was an email to say thanks to this, this guy in our church. And this is what it said. I've taken out the names just uh, for, for um, a bit of you know, privacy there, but this is what it says. The, the wife said, yippee, finally, someone has directed us to a church. They live down south and down the Gold Coast. This, we've been helping, um, this person's been helping them find a church. Yippee, finally, someone has directed us to a church. Thank you so much for all your help and guidance. I can't even begin to thank you enough for all your effort, patience and kindness towards my husband. I'm thrilled that he's found such a wonderful soul to mentor here and steer him towards the light. I can't wait to be surrounded by people who are on the same page as our family. I have personally felt so alone trying to seek the light and the truth of why we are here and what we need to do and where we are heading. My husband's probably told you that I've been a hardcore atheist for at least 35 years due to my academic pursuits. And unfortunately, my bitterness has flowed onto my family and my life in general. I went through my conversion late last year and I was totally alone without any support or understanding for my friends and family. Those were very dark and lonely days for me. But oh my goodness, how the doors quickly flew open for my family when I allowed Jesus into my life. My daughters embraced Jesus so effortlessly and with such joy and happiness. My eldest, 14 years old, has read nearly all of the New Testament 
She religiously reads the Bible every night without fail. She is so connected to Jesus. It absolutely astounds me. I tell her humbly and with pride how pure and holy she is and how she is so much better than me. And she loves hearing me tell her that. (laughs) And then, of course, there is my husband. I never thought in a million years that he would turn to Christ. And I never thought he'd find such a wise, enlightened soul that he so respects it could turn to for guidance. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for the incredible effect you've had on my husband. I certainly know who is working through you and I am eternally grateful. So looking forward to meeting you. How good is that, church? Isn't it amazing how God is working, what he's doing? You know, when you encounter the grace of Jesus, his saving power in our lives, you can't help but be grateful. It reminded me of the words of 2 Corinthians 4, verses 14 and 15. It says this, it says, We know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving. And God will receive more and more glory. And this is our heart as a church. Our heart as a church is that we be a people just continually overflowing with gratitude and grace because of all that God has done for us. We're so blessed. And as we do this, we know that it'll continue to point more and more people to Jesus. I look on and go, what is different about these people? And not only that, not only will more and more people Point, point more and more people to Jesus, but God will receive more and more glory. He will be lifted up. He'll be exalted because I look on and I go, man, those people must be blessed, which we are so blessed. And so my prayer for us today as his people, for you individually, maybe this is a moment where you say, God, okay, I'm going to come. I'm going to give you thanks this morning. In fact, we've got a really practical response. We've got a couple of slips of paper down the front here. One of those slips of paper actually has on it Psalm 100, enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise. And I thought it'd be great to give you an opportunity this morning um, to respond right here and now. We often do some sort of response activity and that is because we want, we want to cement what God is saying to you right now in this moment. It's easy to leave here and get distracted, the business, the pressures of life. There's nothing like right now in this moment, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, showing you something, prompting you for something to say, okay, I'm going to take a step of faith right now. And so the first one, Psalm 100, enter his courts with thanksgiving, is a little piece of paper where you can write some notes um, of thanks to God. Thank God for the things in your life. The front, he's got some lines. If you, if you overflow, if you can't, it's too, too small a space, just turn it over. There's a whole blank page on the back. You can keep writing there. And just express, start your gratitude journal. If you don't do that, it's such a good practice just to take time out, um, just regularly, just to say, God, thank you. If you do your daily quiet time, just make sure you've got some space in there say, God, thank you for this. Thank you for blessing. Thank you for what you've given to me. The simple things, the small things, as well as the big things. You can do that this morning. Start your gratitude, gratitude journal right now. You will leave here feeling uplifted and encouraged by doing that this morning. Maybe that's what you need to do. The other one there has that passage in Philippians 1, the other super paper, which is, I thank God every time I remember you. I want to encourage you this morning. There might be someone you just want to thank um, this morning. Maybe someone in your life who's had an impact or an influence or got the Holy Spirit's just prompting you to thank them this morning. Take this moment now just to write that note of thanks to them. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be too detailed it can just be a very simple you know I thank you and I love the model in Philippians and Colossians it actually shows us how to do it you say I thank God for you you know sometimes you feel a bit awkward giving thanks to people it's a great great format um, to to use I just want to say that I thank God for you Um, is a great way to do that but the power of just taking a moment this morning and for others of you here this morning too I know you're right in that place we are going God where are you It's tough going at the moment. You're asking those questions. Well, God invites you this morning. Come to him, he says. Come to me with your need. Come to me with your troubles. And we'll have some of our prayer team, the pastors will be down here in the prayer team. We'd just love to pray for you this morning. Come to God and say, God, we lift this to you this morning and ask that you'll meet you right in your place of need, whatever that might be this morning. So this is an opportunity for us to respond. Let me pray and then we'll come to do that. Heavenly Father, we thank you. It's been such a Amazing morning, so joy-filled, so full of thanks to you, God, so full of your presence and your love. 
And so, Lord, we hear your word to us this morning. We have so much to give thanks for. And so we want to pray now in these moments as we respond that you'll move by your Holy Spirit. There's something powerful about pausing to give you thanks, to thank one another. And so, Lord, come by your Holy Spirit as we worship you in this way, as we give you thanks. Continue to lead us to you in a deeper way into your presence and others around us too, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.